space. Jellyfish have been around for 600 million years. I can't tell you what it is, but I can't tell you what it is not. Is it a life form? Again, insufficient information. It's possible. is a generic term and it can be applied to biotic kinds of things or it can indeed apply to a craft. Uh, for example, you're a vehicle for something. And so that's what I mean by that term being very generic. Microorganisms that live in these harsh environments we call extremophiles. They have an amazing amount of adaptability that's hardwired in their genomes. You can freeze them, you can bury them a mile down in ice. It really isn't much of a hindrance to these guys because of their adaptable nature. The way it is done is that you get at a high enough voltage with a counter-rotating field you can cause to lift. <laughs> Plankton found in space. As in, there are sea creatures, microplankton, that have been discovered living on the exterior of the ISS. Not only on the exterior of the ISS, but living on the exterior of the ISS. In space, despite the total vacuum, the non-existence of oxygen, and cosmic radiation, these things are surviving on the outside of the windows of the International Space Station. And they are confirmed to have not been carried there by any of the spacecrafts at launch. Plankton are not known to be indigenous to Kazakhstan, where the Russian modules of the station blasted off from. Experts have also claimed that the plankton were not carried there at launch either, because they are marine microorganisms not indigenous to the blast off site. Late 
late 20s in Germany, they were doing things with crystalline structures and they would create a high voltage field around them and found that, especially with crystals, they would kind of begin to resonate and expand, grow, or take up more space, and then they'd float. <laughs> The crystalline entity seems to function like a gigantic electromagnetic collector. It, it needs a lot of power to keep going. Like a giant snowflake crystal, much more complex. The entire electromagnetic spectrum seems to play about inside it, but I haven't the slightest idea of what it is. It's beautiful. What's it doing by some checking this out? Just as we're checking it out. It's trying to communicate with us. I believe so, sir. Water, or the components for it, are being constantly ejected by stars. Add in a little electricity, which is abundant in space, and the hydrogen and oxygen molecules will combine into water. And to that, the studies that have been shown in space dust was primarily freeze-dried bacteria. And perhaps the truth is that our universe is a continuously propagating life generator. The ingredients are literally everywhere. Perhaps life in space is the rule. They don't have nothing to do with us. Then they are. If you, all right, the okay. ETs are so going to have been this, this, this right. call a spade a spade. Yeah. Yeah, they exist. There is no conjecture. They, they do. Yeah, there is stuff. But you know what? Well, that's no big surprise to 50% of people, should we say. Right. But that number's gone up, hasn't it? You know, the, the, the yeah. more and more people realise, you know, more and more, more, you know, NASA have got more and more mm. dash about and, and cannot because of the, the very thing they've created, the media monster behind mm. trying to get money for the space race. Yes. Uh, is still there from the 60s. Yes. Um, and people, there is a lot of people that are very interested in it. Mm. Uh, and so because of that, cameras are on the shuttle. And because of the internet and various people that are clever with the internet. Cameras on the shuttle and people yeah, are clever with computers. To, what I'm trying to say is, um, you can't, there's so many now. Yes. You can't keep your lid on everything. You're saying it's impossible to yeah, hide yeah. the reality. And there's a certain piece of um, video that is quite prevalent on the internet of a circular thing behind, rolling behind a tether. Yes, I know that one. That's factual. Yes. A couple of miles across, mm -hmm. but it's not a ship, mm -hmm. and things aren't what you think they are out there. You should regard space more as an ocean. Uh, okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We've got no right to turn around and say intelligent or unintelligent, mm -hmm. you know, because then what you're doing, you're mm -hmm. comparing things to your intellect, aren't you? Okay. And how can you compare that to a human? Are you stating this as a fact? Absolutely. A fact. And what you're talking about here is you're talking about large, large living beings, like big kind of... And small. And small living and beings. Look at it this way. If you've got a shark swimming through the ocean, he's mm. got fish swimming all around him most of the time, mm -hmm. picking up morsels, mm -hmm. um, servicing him, mm -hmm. and he doesn't eat them. Mm -hmm. They go right in his mouth. Yes, yes, yes. And come out, you know, that's a natural thing, yeah? Yeah. Is it so far-fetched for you to understand that that could be the situation out there? Okay. Existing as we do in three dimensions, it's hard enough for us to imagine a fourth or fifth. But consider a sixth dimension, transcending time and space, where corporal form can be distilled into pure energy. In physical terms, such beings would simply disappear. It is harmonic frequencies and vibrations that bring harmony and order to all living and non-living energy systems. Our sun is a living, great being, providing mantras and yantras, geometries, for all living things. <laughs> pictures of what he called critters. Tardigrades have been around for over 600 million years. They're the ultimate survivors. They measure only one... 
but they are fully developed animals. Tardigrades are a lot more complicated than something as simple as bacteria. They're multicellular animals. They, they have eyes and legs and walk around uh, like we do. But what makes tardigrades particularly fascinating is their unique survival mechanism. Tardigrades become virtually indestructible when their bodies dehydrate. The body stops all movement, the legs disappear, and the tardigrades shrink into a ball. Scientists call this mass a ton. When tardigrades enter the ton stage, the metabolism has stopped and they can survive in incredible conditions. They'll survive down to below one degree Kelvin, which is close to where molecular motion completely stops. They can also survive temperatures as high as 424 degrees Kelvin, or 303 degrees Fahrenheit. They'll survive extremes of temperature, extremes of pressure, extremes of uh, radiation. Qualities that would make tardigrades the perfect space traveler. It's as if they're dead, but they're called cryptobiotic, they're in cryptobiosis, which means that they're it's as if they're dead, but if you add water, then they revive and they walk away. In 2007, scientists even exposed tardigrades to the vacuum of space to further study this amazing survival technique. When they brought them back down, they added water to them and they walked away just fine, they produced embryos again. Rangiomorphs. Some are as old as 579 million years. It's called, and is known around the world as, Charnia, after the forest in which it was discovered. But what is it? Is it animal or plant? The fact is it comes from such a remote period that the distinction between those two forms of life was not yet clear. This is Fractifusis. It's the most common fossil in the mistaken point assemblage. We have literally thousands of specimens. And it would have lain on the sea bottom like you see there, a spindle-shaped mass, very thin. It consists of these elements. And there are 20 of them on either side. And if you look at an individual element, it's remarkably finely branched. It's a style we call fractal or self-similar. You're calling this an animal, but uh, is it justified calling it an animal? Well, well, what is it? It's a big question. We know for a fact it can't be a plant. If we're in water thousands of meters deep, there wouldn't be enough light down here to read the headlines in a newspaper where several orders of magnitude, too little light for photosynthesis. Okay, so it's not photosynthesizing because it's too deep, never got it. It's not a plant. It's what you're living on. What we believe they're living on is dissolved carbon and other nutrients in the deep oceans. So it's absorbing these nutrients through its entire body. Very thin, probably not much thicker than your thumbnail. Very primitive. It's not like it's not like on Earth today. One of the most peculiar things about these wonderful proto animals is the way they constructed their bodies. Unlike modern creatures, they had a very simple pattern of branching. They can be put together with just six to eight genetic commands, as against some 25,000 such commands that we needed to construct an animal like me. You can see this if you look at them in detail. You see that they are made up of a series of very small modules which are attached to one another in a number of different ways. These fractal organisms grew by repetitive branching, with each branch exactly the same as its predecessor from the microscopic level upwards. It was a simple yet extremely effective way of building a body. Such finely divided branches gave the organism a huge surface area, and this allowed them to absorb nutrients directly, without mouths and without guts. This simple fractal body plan proved very successful. So animals using it grew large for the first time in the history of life on Earth. Perhaps some kind of area required to get nutrient from the relative vacuum of goddamn space. There would be no limit to the size of these things. The size surface area to mass ratio could be conducive to live with the market of goddamn atmosphere and beyond the goddamn space. Give you a lift. The fractal design was perfect for getting these earliest creatures off and running, and it's easy to see why. They take a minimum of genetic programming in order to make one. You could probably do it with six or eight codes in your PC to make something that was fractally branching. And then combining them to make up larger elements is literally child's play, like a toddler might take Lego blocks and put them all together to make a larger structure. Just a few million years after they first evolved, they vanished. They have no living descendants. They were an evolutionary dead end. Or perhaps not. It is conceivable that these creatures were driven from the seas into the atmosphere, from there into space, by the rise of predation on Earth. They utterly dominated about the first 20 million years of the evolution of complex multicellular proto-animals because they were incapable of evolving things like guts and brains and muscles and teeth that later animals did. Perhaps the absence of these characteristics is what allowed these creatures to become adaptable to the environment of space where other terrestrial life forms have not. The characteristics of terrestrial complex life is perhaps an impediment to life in space. Up to this moment, living cells that have been produced by division simply drifted away from one another. But now, with the aid of increased oxygen, some cells were sticking together. The advantages of being multicelled were many. Colonies of cells could collect more food, control their internal environment, and act efficiently by working as a team. Sponges are just collections of simple cells that have clumped together and got stuck together. They don't have a digestive system or a nervous system or a blood circulatory system and they get their food and their oxygen by just pumping seawater through channels in the body. But they can give us an indication of how it was that cells first clumped together to form bodies of any real size. At the microscopic level, sponge cells are bound together by a tangle of long hairy stringy protein molecules called collagen. 
This collagen glue is found only in animals and nowhere else. Collagen is sometimes called the sticky tape of the animal world. Collagen is some kind of extracellular but protein. They adapted to stick cells together so that they did not need proximity to one another, so that they could be break distance apart. If they fuck, could extracellular proteins become the dominant part of the creature? Could the cells themselves become obsolete? The protein structure that surrounds the cells will form geometric pattern with high surface area, by the direct internal surface of which the epidural canals that facilitate it. The cells become colonialized without being physically stepped together at all. Do the units of a biological colony? Physically stepped together, is it possible that there are other methods to give colonial cohesion? They may be self-organizing. Maybe. And what cymatics does is use sound vibration in different frequencies to create geometrical forms from particles, which without the sound, the vibration, are just all over the place, random. There's suddenly there's a sound, woo, they move into these amazing shapes. This is how matter is created out of the void. Change the vibration, change the shape, change the shape, change the vibration. Using this method, these creatures can demonstrate extreme polymorphism. Oh, it's a kind of self-perpetuating rotational force. And all kinds of things. Some people will determine all the unity, perpetual motion machines, rotation, and energy. Space jellyfish might be a portal through which energy enters our universe. Space jellyfish might facilitate universal goddamn expansion. <laughs> The spherical plasma dynamo will take energy in the form of plasma flow from the local interstellar medium converting into electromagnetic energy forming heat and light. Neutral particles from the local interstellar medium will become ionized spiraling down forming an electrical current in the plasma flow. This will power the plasma dynamo that will act like a superconducting coil producing electromagnetic fields. Coming. Simple to pick up plasma energy plasma variable one, mark two zero, range, plus one is ability. I'll straight. Energy times are being as highly organized. I like them. Set my context. Using a simple sir. Pause speaker. Calamarine are not very hospitable creatures. They exist as swirls of ionized gas. First, a sponge is cut into small pieces. Then it's pushed through a sieve at the end of a syringe. This breaks the animal down into its individual cells. This may seem a brutal thing to do to a living organism, but to a sponge, this is of no consequence. In response, it does something quite astonishing. The cells begin to move, and then they form clumps. Soon the clumps form bigger clumps, until three weeks later, a miniature sponge has formed. Sponges have this amazing capacity to regenerate themselves. From this experiment, we can maybe infer a few things that happened 600 million years ago with the very first animals. We can infer that there were cells coming together. They could adhere to each other. They used extracellular proteins like collagen to glue themselves together. They had the ability to communicate with each other and they had a certain amount of flexibility that allowed them to interact to give rise to something that's bigger and greater, a large macroscopic Multicellular animal. Calm, complexity, from which we infer success and terrestrial life has tended towards the bilaterally symmetrical and toward differentiation of cells and tissues and toward centralization of function and command and control. It is possible in space there are the opposite evolutionary imperatives and the greatly symmetrical forms and colonial decentralized homogenized function predominates. Colonial cells can become complex by becoming increasingly independent and differentiated, sacrificing the autonomy of the individual cellular unit. However, it is conceivable that a colony could develop complexity and dynamic function of colony and individual without detriment to the autonomous function of one or the other. The qualities of the individual and the collective being self-similar and complementary, cumulative and exponential in effect. The actions of the colony multiply the actions of the individual. Just as each unit of the colony can change shape at will, controlling its surface area to volume stroke mass ratio. The colony can also. There is a kind of chicken and egg relationship between the two morphologies. Chicken and spherical or the frack colony of cells rotating individually and collectively. Their individual and collective vibration and roll. Tations with manifest morphology and vice versa. Space jellyfish may be able to become toral at the cellular level, unknown in terrestrial life. The toral morphology may be the form in which they have particular abilities that contrast with the spherical and elongated forms. Or morphology is manifestation of interactive waveforms. You could ask if the creature really exists as a manifest physically, or does it exist merely as a specific waveform? These things evolve and evolve towards being non-corporeal. They don't give a fuck. Life started as non-corporeal, and it tries to be so again. For constructed vessels, there is a requirement for inertial dampening, for it and its occupants to survive the stresses and impact of traveling so far. 
This is a shield around the vehicle to stop the inertial mass from having any sizable impact whatsoever. This means the craft can accelerate at phenomenal speed, because their own mass effectively is tiny. Space jellyfish negate the need for this by being relatively massless to begin with, allowing them to attain and survive very high speeds, g-forces and impacts. The holographic physiology of these creatures also lends itself to this, making them essentially invulnerable, allowing them to change shape, disperse and reform at will. Their simple, colonial nature, like sponges or porphyr, means you could liquidize one of these things. It would survive, put itself back together. You can't do this with a human being or other multicellular life form. The differentiated morphology doesn't allow for this. It is a superior form of life. Superior. Totally. There could be no limit to the numbers in each colony. There could be miles or even millions of miles in diameter. And no limit to the goddamn shape and maximum and minimum volume, mass and surface area of the colony at any goddamn time. They could instantly change shape at a micro and microcosmic level. May instantly change, but one into many, and back again, or differentiate one from another. Is there just one big space jellyfish subdivided? There will be divergent types. Within each type, distinguishing the individual from the colony may be vexing. None of them may be genetically unique, likely born from asexual reproduction. Each species may be a single goddamn organism, or each goddamn space jellyfish may be millions of species living, colonial, goddamnly. Why does abundance in space? As it is in the reverse conditions, in the deepest oceans, and always has been, as we see, more faithfully in the media with regards to our exploration of space, to cover up for the abundance of life in space. We have desperately not to allow the notion of life in space to be normalized, and people are aware of the normality of life in space. We have by the invasion scenario, pushed through mainstream ufology, the either shock value, I believe, for some dastardly goddamn plan. They're not threat to us, nor us to them. They no more recognize us, essential life forms, as we do today. Mainstream ufology is a load of other dog shit created by the goddamn military. Any military has a vested interest in convincing its enemies that they can shoot down UFOs, and that they have recovered alien technology and re engineered it. Of course, that is what they want their enemies to think. The advanced aliens from the other side of the galaxy could not think of a self-destruct mechanism from the writers of the project to conceive of such a device. Even if they forgot to install one, they could come back, be mentioned to cargo hold the fuck off. The military may have many advanced crafts, some possibly inspired by the movement and capabilities of space jellyfish, but humans will never be able to swim, as well as goddamn fish. The closest analogue to the hollow perforated sphere colonial space jellyfish model of a known terrestrial life is an algae known as Vol Vox. That is Vol Vox. This Vol Vox is classified as a member of Plankton, that is Plankton, Phylum, Glorophyta, Class, Glorophyce, Order, Volvocales, and Family, Volvocaceae. These Vol Vox are usually seen in the form of a complex family referred to as Synovium. And in the life cycle as a whole, every cell of a Synovium plays a collaborative activity with facilitate completion of life cycle, as well as absorbing, using, and excreting whatever it is producing as a waste or a byproduct. Vol Vox is usually classified as a colony. A colony refers to a group of cells which are adhered together, either due to the presence of certain media or where they cooperate and collaborate with each other to facilitate the assemblage of a large number of cells together to create one colony. Now, in case of the Volvox, the average number of individuals or Volvox individuals in that colony can vary from minimum 500 to maximum about 50,000. That means, if the number is so variable, automatically there will be tremendous size variability of an individual colony of different species of Volvox. It is very rare when a single cell of Volvox is seen as an individual plant or individual algae. This is primarily because the interdependence of a group of cells in one particular colony facilitates not only survival but also helps it to synthesize what it requires for development multiplication, reproduction, as well as sustenance of varied habitat conditions. But it usually attains one uniform shape, that is, rounded or circular. And in this circular colony, we have seen that usually every cell is having an oval shape, and at the peripheral portions, that is the apical portion, it is provided or it is facilitated by the presence of two flagella. We normally refer to this as a biflagellate algal cell. These two flagella facilitate the movement of individual cells and the movement of a colony of cells if they are added together or bound together. Once we look at these biflagellate cells' movements, that movement is also a collaborative movement. Collaborative refers to whatever direction a cell wants to move. Usually, each cell has a position to actually facilitate the movement of each other towards that direction. The movement in particular direction is actually dependent upon the movement by these flagella. That even reflects that be it colonial, be it single cell volvox, will find that these flagella actually facilitate its movement from one direction to another in the form of the flagellar movements. Within each cell of this volvox colony, we find that there is a single nucleus located towards one particular portion, preferring the basal part of the flagella. That means the flagella actually facilitate the normal maintenance of the nucleus, wherein whatever direction the nucleus directs the cell to move in, or whatever direction the nucleus facilitates the movement of the cell, the flagella will get or derive its direction from the nucleus itself. That is, nuclear manipulation is facilitating the movement of not only cell, but sometimes of the whole colony, as desired or as directed by the nucleus itself. And in every volvox cell, we also find that there is an ice spot depicting thereby that this flagella and the nucleus is actually facilitating the cooperative activity within the cell of the volvox and ultimately within the colony of the volvox of a particular species, thereby facilitating not only the desired movement but also shifting from the reproductive cycle sometimes towards the vegetative developmental cycles. We all know that fire is inanimate, but anyone staring into a flame could be excused for thinking otherwise. Fire dances and swirls, it reproduces, consumes matter, and it produces waste. It needs oxygen to survive. In short, fire is uncannily lifelike. Unlike flames on Earth, which have a teardrop shape caused by buoyant air rising in a gravitational field, flames in space curl themselves into tiny balls. Untethered by gravity, they float around as if they have minds of their own. More than one astronaut conducting experiments for researchers on Earth below has been struck by the way flame balls roam their test chambers in a lifelike search for oxygen and fuel. Biologists confirm that fire is not alive. Nevertheless, on August 21st, astronaut Reed Wiseman on the International Space Station witnessed some of the best mimicry yet. It was a jellyfish of fire he tweeted to Earth along with a video. Wiseman was running an experiment called Flux 2. The jellyfish phenomenon Wiseman witnessed is a great example. He points out some of the key elements of the video. Near the beginning, we see two needles dispensing a droplet mixture of heptane and isooctane between two igniters. The fuel is ignited. Then the lights go out so we can see what happens next. The flame forms a blue spherical shell 15 to 20 millimeters in diameter around the fuel. Inside that spherical flame, we see some bright yellow hotspots. Those are made of soot. Heptane produces a lot of soot as it burns, he explains, consisting mainly of carbon with a sprinkling of hydrogen. Soot burns hot, around 2,000 degrees Kelvin, and glows brightly as a result. 
Several globules of burning soot can be seen inside the sphere, he continues. At one point, a blob of soot punctures the flame sphere and exits. The soot that exits fades away as it burns out. There is also an S-shaped object inside the sphere. That is another soot structure, he says. The jellyfish phase is closely linked to the production of soot. Combustion products from the spherical flame drift back onto the fuel droplet. Because sooty material deposited on the droplet is not perfectly homogeneous, we can get a disruptive burning event, says Foreman. In other words, soot on the surface of the fuel droplet catches fire, resulting in a lopsided explosion. At the end of Wiseman's video, the soot ignites in a final explosion. That's how the fire put itself out. Most people feel disgusted by these animals, but in reality they are smooth, soft, and what's even more interesting, their history goes back 500 million years. During this time they have developed the most fascinating shapes and most interesting lifestyles. Upside down jellyfish. These jellyfish have two ways of gathering food. Either they wave their tentacles around to draw plankton in towards their mouths, or they make use of the single-celled algae that live inside the jellyfish and generate energy for them from the sunlight. Out of its domain, the great jelly melts into a watery pile. They are essentially one cell layer thick on, on these two surfaces. And this is about 96% water. 96%. So these guys can get huge uh, with, with very little um, energy. Yeah. <laughs> he described the foil-like material, much like that reported, discovered after Roswell crash. He described the foil as 12 layers of material less than 10 thousandths of an inch thick. It was as flexible as a plastic trash bag, but virtually indestructible to piercing, burning, or cutting. Far from being mindless blobs drifting at the whim of the ocean, box jellyfish swim with purpose at about the same speed a human walks. While most jellyfish are blind, box jellies have evolved with four eye clusters, one at each corner of their cube-shaped body. The clusters are largely comprised of primitive cells for detecting light and dark, but at the center of each is a single eye with remarkable similarities to our own. A pupil, an iris, a cornea, a lens, and a retina. This is astonishing which they can rotate to see in any direction. It doesn't make sense. What can you do with such a complex eye without a brain? They're hardly visible, embedded in special sensory niches. Only if magnified 50 to 100 times are they identifiable as eyes. Wonder, do the eyes play a role in their swimming behavior? Dr. Angel Yanagihara puts the box jelly's vision to the test. First, she replaces the ambient light with a barely visible red glow. That's really bizarre. Completely stuck in the activity. We never see that in the white light. Right. Could this primitive life form be adapting its behavior to the light? Generally, the ability to rest is attributed only to creatures with some kind of brain capacity. But these animals don't have a brain. Now, Angel tests the box jelly's vision against a simple obstacle course. Here they come. Well, when right straight into it. It's not like anything they would encounter in the natural world, and they're clearly having trouble. But when Angel swaps the clear tubes for a quick ones, it's a completely different story. See how it slowed down and is avoiding the obstacle altogether? This one came in, almost grazed it, and made it last minute navigational correction. It's pretty impressive. So they seem to be able to perceive the obstacle and then alter their body pattern so they can swim around it. But something else is happening in the tank, something which goes beyond the simple test of vision. We've been watching them now for about 10 minutes, and what's really interesting to me is, are they learning this obstacle course? Not only are they making decisions, they're quickly improving their skills. They don't have a brain, they have a neural network, so how do they process that? How are they capable of this kind of um, remarkable behavior? Does the box jellyfish really exhibit intelligence? Can it learn about new environments? The jellies, because they're mostly water, have the ability to carry their oxygen within this layer of, of highly watery jelly uh, material. All right, so the low oxygen is 1.2, the high oxygen is 8.7. Both of the fish, when they go in, look really good. Both of the fish, when they go in, look relatively happy. Both of the fish, when they go in, look relatively happy. Jellyfish look good. Everybody's swimming. But soon, the fish in low oxygen isn't faring so well. You can already kind of see that, that this fish is behaving a little bit differently than, than this fish over here. Every now and then he looks like he's taking a little more gulps and, and, and trying to ventilate his gills. The jellyfish seems completely unaffected by the lack of oxygen. 
But it is amazing for how long jellyfish have been around, how little we know about them, their life cycles, what makes them reproduce. First, fertilized jellyfish eggs transform into microscopic larvae. These jellyfish larvae float through the water until they find a hard surface to cling to. Once grounded, they change into cup-shaped polyps, which then clone themselves over and over again, creating the seeds of a billion-strong army whose whereabouts are a complete mystery. They say that we know more about outer space than the deep sea, and so the polyps are out there living somewhere on the ocean floor, and we don't know where most of them are. They can sit dormant for years, probably even decades. Then when conditions are just right, the polyps begin to grow. They elongate and segment into a stack of baby jellyfish. If we look closely, we can see them right here. A pulsing brood of alien-looking life forms. And then one at a time, the baby jellyfish will release and swim away and uh, grow up into adult medusa. There's no light, barely any food, and the water pressure is so intense it could kill a man in seconds. And still, the jellyfish are thriving. A gelatinous animal grows fast, reproduces quickly, and can fill that niche. Jellyfish have had 600 million years to perfect their survival skills. Our particular life form can only exist within pretty finely delimited conditions, whereas this ancient life form is far more robust and resilient. They were one of the first creatures to freely roam the planet. They have survived catastrophic changes that wiped out almost all life on Earth. They thrive in the most extreme environments, from the icy waters of the Arctic to the heat of toxic ocean vents. Thank 
attitudes and by some motive, some physical motive, can sometimes perform. So far, Darangel has unearthed nine similar reports of angel hair falling in various parts of Portugal dating back to 1857. Clearly, these things throw among the radiata. They have benefited from not adopting a bilaterally symmetrical morphology, generally encouraged by movement across the surface of planetary bodies. The retention of radial symmetry has been of great benefit to these creatures. It is likely that some will have taken on bilaterally symmetrical forms, with anterior and posterior ends, with movement like ours, forwards and backwards, and left and right, and up and got them down. If most, Pure space jellyfish forms will move to and away from without any notion of forward or backwards or left or right or up or cut them down. These things, no goddamn cylindrates, some kind of colonial microbe, probably not even eukaryotic. Who knows? These things could be all kinds of things to me. Things. It might be a tumor. It's not a tumor. Not a tumor at all. They could come from any known kingdom of life, or may represent a new kingdom, or even kingdoms of life. Or may be an unknown part of the life cycle of some known terrestrial life form. Or could conceivably be the general life in the goddamn universe, including all life on Earth. What the hell are you? These creatures are relatively massless and require little energy to move. We can assume they require energy to grow and reproduce. They may have achieved 100% efficiency or have no energy deficit. They may access the infinite energy at zero. At that point. It's energy that exists at zero degrees Kelvin. At zero degrees. From outside the known universe, goddammit. In the goddamn vacuum of space. We have no way of knowing how complex nervous systems would develop in the radiata. They may become centralized, but not necessarily satellite. With the radio circumferential cords, there could be a central ganglial mass. Or oh, uh, many dotted symmetrically through the body of the creature. There may be no ganglia. The whole thing could act as one big ganglia, one big unsatellite. A radially symmetrical brain with nerve loops that send pulses around on the rond on the rond. Have nerve loops and vast numbers. These loops could be made of circular nerve arcs. Pulses sent through these could create a control of magnetic field around the creature. Billions of these nerves send controlled nerve pulses. Circumferentially with rotations and counter rotations. This non satellite brain could begin to act like a an electromagnetic gravitic engine. Electromagnetic gravitics. What am I talking about? High voltage systems with certain resonant fields and certain specialized materials that allow for us to have lift. The way it is done is that you, at a high enough voltage with a counter rotating field, you can cause lift. Whereas humans would have great difficulty piloting such a device, the engine is perfectly interfaced with the brain of these creatures. In fact, the mechanism is the function of the brain. Luminous beings are these. Not through they move, but the power of the brain. Quite trying to get something galaxy in the blink of an eye. Whilst we are impressed by the speed of travel, they may be amazed that we can travel so slow. These things spin so fast, they exist outside the parameters of our reality. We can only see them when they slow down, unmaterialize, and take on solidity and manifest physically. The faster they spin, the less mass they have, so they go faster and faster. Equally, if they decelerate, they gain mass and slow down more and more. If they slow down too much, they may be unable to speak up again. So maybe why they avoid fully materializing. For them to become too solid may be deadly.
exhaust gas is also negatively ionized, that all of a sudden we have the high voltage charge separation that's necessary to provide an extra propulsive force, especially at high velocities. So electrogravity uh, in that um, aspect is a very simple process, but does provide a good amount of force for a very small amount of energy input. As with many other promising inventions developed during the Cold War years, the National Secrecy Act prevented scientists like T. Townsend Brown from commercializing or even publicizing any technology which could potentially be interpreted as having a military application. Team of British scientists say they've discovered just that small box which appear to have arrived from space. They found the tiny organisms after sending a specially designed balloon around 20 miles into the stratosphere during a recent meteor shower. Experts say the bugs are too large to have come from Earth. Hmm. Thomas Moore has more on that. Should we be scared? <laughs> I don't think there's anything to be scared of, though if you look at some of the, uh, the, the photos, they do look uh, quite daunting. I, I think this is really interesting, and there has been this long-standing theory that life was seeded on Earth. It hasn't been a theory that's been accepted by all, but these Sheffield scientists say that this is first direct evidence that there are microbes high up in the stratosphere. Now, they can think of no possible explanation of how those got up there, other than they were brought down during a, a meteor shower. You remember the Perseid meteor shower very recently. That's when they sent up the balloon. And they, and they only exposed the collecting plates once the balloon reached that high altitude. They took strict precautions that it wasn't contaminated with life down here on Earth. And it does raise all sorts of questions. Uh, it really does, doesn't it? It's, it's quite, but we shouldn't be alarmed. No, I, I don't think so. If you look at this, there's one, I hope we can get one, one of the photographs up. It does look a bit like an elephant's head. Now, bear in mind that this is just two or three times the width of a human hair, so it really is uh, tiny. Uh, that's not the one, if we can find the one with the elephant's head. Um, but you will see that it has almost like a long trunk, uh, and it, that's not the one. That's the one, right. Oh, no. yeah. <laughs> the elephant's trunk, that might, could well be a tail. Uh, at the other end, they see evidence of uh, a mouth-like uh, orifice, which might be something to do with feeding. Uh, and on the side there, it looks like an ear. Uh, they think that that may well be a flipper that they would use to, to get around uh, in, in water somewhere else in space. This astonishing image that you're seeing above is of an organism found in space that has baffled scientists. It follows findings that DNA capable of inserting itself into living creatures and replicating can exist in harsh space conditions. A tiny plasmid, a circular strand of DNA used in genetic engineering, was sent into space from Sweden in 2011 on the exterior of a Texas 49 rocket. After enduring a thousand degrees Celsius of heat, it was found to still be intact with its biological properties when it returned to Earth. Professor Chandra Ramasing, director of the Buckingham Center for Astrobiology at the University of Buckingham in England, said that it is further proof of alien life. However, this latest finding by Professor Milton Wainwright and his team from the University of Sheffield and the University of Buckingham Center for Astrobiology, Professor Wainwright said that the structure is made from the metals titanium and vanadium, with a gooey biological liquid oozing from its center. It is a ball with about the width of a human hair, which has filamentous life on the outside and a gooey biological material oozing from its center, he said. We were stunned when X-ray analysis showed that the sphere is made up of mainly titanium with a trace of vanadium. Professor Wainwright and his team found the object in dust and particulate matter collected from the stratosphere. He sent balloons 27 kilometers into the sky to collect debris from space and isolated several particles he claims are proof of life in space. It comes as a mysterious ghost particle also found by Professor Wainwright was revealed and follows the revelation last year of the astonishing dragon particle, the first of its kind to point towards proof of life in space. Professor Wainwright said the curious orb landed on the sampler balloon and it left a tiny impact crater, proving it could not have gently fallen from close by. This impact crater proves that the sphere was incoming to Earth from space. An organism coming from Earth would not be traveling fast enough when it fell back to Earth to cause such damage. This seems never before to have been found on Earth. He said that said that for the moment we are content to say that the life-containing titanium sphere came from space, probably from a comet. NASA is currently sending a balloon into the stratosphere to also look for life. Hopefully, he said, they will get the same results as we have, whether or not they acknowledge them.
by flying in the upper atmosphere of planets. One important thing I must say, though, about these space serpents is that there are about seven or eight very, very important uh, ancient sites, temple sites, uh, on planet Earth, most notably in Mexico. And these temples are dedicated to the memory of flying serpents. And this is what we see in this footage, is flying serpents. There also seems to be a very interesting relationship between the flying serpent and these small luminous spheres. And many times these objects appear or creature or organism very close to what we call the sentinel. The sentinel takes care of these uh, objects, whatever they are. I believe they they take the spheres inside. They are made by the spheres. You have to remember that Mexico has this legend, Quetzalcoatl, Pukulcan, the flying serpent, the feathered serpent, the colorful serpent. I really think this myth, this legend, is related to this phenomenon. Sometimes these uh, entities uh, release spheres for some reason, we don't know. This may not represent the creatures in their usual state. This may be some kind of colonial clamping. Maybe just a body stage. No life cycle of these creatures. This purpose we can only speculate upon. Maybe a sexual or asexual spawning stage. Maybe related to feeding. Again, what stimulates it remains unknown. God's name. What the fuck? What the fuck? This grave is a veteran of five American shuttle missions who has seen and photographed several unidentified flying objects in space. Dr. Musgrave does not believe they are craft from another planet. On two of my missions, and I still don't have an answer, um, I have seen a, a snake out there. The more you fly in space, the more you see an incredible amount of things out there, and that sort of brings to you a, really a certainty that, uh, that other living creatures are out there. Some are incredibly primitive, more primitive than us. Some just, uh, just proteins coming together, amino acids, and some just single cell organisms, and other civilizations have been around for a million years that are doing unimaginable kinds of things. You see, some marine animals live together, forming a much bigger organism. Take coral reefs. Corals are formed by colonies of creatures known as polyps. These tiny animals build a hard exoskeleton around them. And living together in their billions, they form some of the world's largest and most spectacular structures. Like the Great Barrier Reef. And it's not just corals that take to communal living. Our giant tube is actually a colony of tiny animals, known as a pyrocyte. These are colonial tuna pits. It's a colony of Thalesia. They're not jellyfish, but astonishingly are more closely related to vertebrates, even us. This Portuguese man of war is not a true jellyfish, but a colony of polyps. It drifts through the world's oceans with a gas-filled float. Each polyp has a specific task assigned to it. They would not be able to survive on their own. These jellies can't dive, but they can sail and cover thousands of kilometers this way. But that's also a weakness, as they often drift ashore. It catches its prey with its deadly weapons immediately below the ocean surface. The sail is both a drawback and an advantage. A school of fish can be reached quickly, and it carries an armada of stinging appendages which can be extended up to ten meters. The Portuguese man-of-war will fire off whole batteries of stinging cells at its victims. It's clearly visible that the Medusa stockpiles food. The term siphonophore, or colonial jelly, implies a number of beings. The colony consists of members that contribute the float sail and polyps, as well as the ones that fulfill all the other functions necessary for survival.
Captain. Length, approximately 11,000 miles. Width, varying from 2,000 to 3,000 miles. Outer layer studded with space debris and waste. Interior consists of protoplasm, varying from a firmer gelatinous layer to a semi-fluid central mass. Condition, living. That is an amoeba. Yes, I remember my basic biology like Do you mean to tell me that, that thing out there is a giant single-celled animal? Yes, for lack of a better term. It's a very simple form of life. In fact, it's a much simpler form of life, what you're looking at now. That thing out there apparently can perform all the functions of qualified as a living organism. It can reproduce, it can breathe, it can eat. Although I don't know why. Energy itself, perhaps. A giant one-cell creature living at the bottom of the ocean. Sounds like something from a horror film, but it seems we've actually captured one on tape. Scientists at Scripps Institution of Oceanography, along with National Geographic engineers, have lowered three falling cameras into the heart of the Mariana Trench. At depths exceeding 10,500 meters, cameras film creatures thriving under extreme pressures and in complete darkness, including this giant amoeba that's over 10 centimeters in length. It's the largest single-cell creature on the planet, and it's never been found this deep in the ocean. decided he thought he could see it in the telescope and he was able to do that and when, when it was in one position it had a series of ellipses. Now obviously the three of us were not going to blurt out, hey Houston we got something moving alongside of us and uh, we don't know what it is, you know, can you tell us what it is? We weren't about to do that because uh, we know that uh, the, those transmissions would be heard by all sorts of people and uh, who knows what somebody would have demanded that we uh, turn back because of aliens or whatever the reason is. So we, we didn't do that, but we did uh, decide, we, we just cautiously ask uh, Houston where, how far away was the S4B? Paul, I'm Houston. The S4B is about 1,000 nautical miles from you now, over. Yeah, it's about 1,000 few moments later when they came back and said something like it was 6,000 miles away because of the, the maneuver. So we really didn't think we were looking at something that far away. So we decided uh, that after a while watching it, uh, we, it was time to go to sleep and not to talk about it anymore until they came back in, in debriefing. <laughs> forms of bioluminescence. The jelly's light is cold light. During this highly efficient biochemical process, no energy is lost to the creation of warmth. The ability to create light serves the fish in many different ways. One could be communication with fellow species members. It could help to lure prey towards the fish, and also to recognize either friend or foe. Every species has its own rhythms and patterns, may be also used as a deterrent.
Eugene Okunov was experimenting with superconductors. Oh. In this case, if it is used in an electric generator, much of electric currents can be achieved. Conventional physics tells us that if you spin conducting disc in a magnetic field, an electric current is generated. The faster the rotation, the higher the current. Okunov found that when a superconducting disc is spun at very high speed in a magnetic field, and other effects are reduced. If an object is placed in the center of the disc, its weight reduces due to an anti-gravity effect or gravity of magnetic field. It's believed that this type of machine can be improved by instead of rotating a solid superconductor, a frictionless conducting liquid or superfluid could be used. The anti-gravity effect of such a machine would only be limited by how fast the liquid could rotate. If we were to use this technology to design a vehicle to travel into space, it would look like a flying saucer. In fact, it would have all of the characteristics which are observed for flying saucers. In 1996, theoretic physicist Miguel Alcudia produced a remarkable paper which grew from his work in general relativity, which is the current standard model for space time gravitation. This paper was titled very useful solution. millions of cuttlefish as it roams the oceans. It is not evil, it is feeding. Oh. 